Okay, hi again. Uh, we are moving along here with our uh, look at the theropods. This is a second slideshow, and we're um, going to look at some more specific groups as we make our way uh, through the theropods to the most uh, derived, the most advanced ones, uh, the ones that are living today, the birds. So let me move ahead here and start the slideshow. In fact, uh, today we're going to uh, just uh, mention a few words about these guys right here. This is a Spinosaurus. So we've looked at the Coelophysids and we've looked at the Ceratosauria. Uh, and we are now going to look at the Titanarae. Titanarae uh, meaning a stiff tail. And we'll see uh, why they are called such uh, in a minute here. The diagnostic characteristics are that the teeth and the jaws are all rostral to the orbit. So that means that they all are found uh, closer um, in front of the orbit, uh, on the rostral side of the orbit, on the nasal side of the orbit. Uh, they have lost a, a digit, another digit in their hands. Digit four is lost. So um, they have three digits uh, remaining. Um, they have these, um, what I would say are the uh, zygas, cranial zyga Hypotheses are on their caudal vertebrae and they're elongate. Wow. Uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that so that we know exactly what that means. So here we are looking at some of these diagnostic characteristics. So um, with the coelophysis, you see that the uh, uh, teeth uh, make their way all back to the uh, position of the orbit. While in a titanarae like Allosaurus, the teeth uh, end well in front of the orbit. That's one of the diagnostic characteristics. The second one is the fact that they've lost their fourth digit. So here's a Dilophosaurus that we looked at last time. It had three digits and the fourth one in the hand was much reduced. The fifth one was lost. This is a Dinocheris. Um, pretty impressive guy here. Um, I think it's a Theracinosaur and it has got um, these nice three claws, no fourth or fifth uh, digit. Looks like it really didn't need a fourth or fifth digit. And now we'll look at those cranial zygopophyses. So what does that mean? And they're on the caudal vertebrae, so we know that they're on the tail. So here they are. Here are the vertebrae on the tail of an Allosaurus, one of the Tantanarae. And here are the zygas. They're pointing toward the cranial part or the front of the uh, dinosaur, sort of really pretty odd there. They're nice and elongate. Um, what do they do? They actually, this, this is one of the features that stiffens the tail. Um, and you know, um, as we go along through the group of theropods, we'll see that there is a um, tendency for uh, features to stiffen that tail except right at the the base of it, the uh, where it connects to the rest of the body. But distally, as we go further and out, uh, the tail gets quite stiff. And we've seen that sort of as a, uh, um, a way of balancing the dinosaur's front end, uh, sort of serving as a balance so that when the dinosaur uh, changes directions, it's sort of using that tail as a counterbalance to the front part of its body. So the tannery. Now, you know, I'm going to show this here. We're going to look at a couple of the uh, tannery that are close to the, um, the common ancestor, the spinosaurs and the megalosaurs. And then uh, in the next slide show, uh, we're going to talk about a very big group, the, the avatheropods. And the avatheropods are really um, the ones that uh, will lead into the feathered dinosaurs. Um, and I don't think I mentioned this before, but, but when we looked at um, Carnotaurus back here in the um, ceratosaurs, we, um, we did find, paleontologists have found some skin impressions and they showed that they were uh, reptile-like scales. So we didn't see any feathers in the ceratosaurs, but we are becoming more and more careful about what we say about the uh, skin features 
of dinosaurs um, that are getting closer and closer to the feathered ones. How far back did feathers go? And we'll talk about that a little bit. But the other part that I just want to mention here is, just to, to bring this home, is that so all the all the all these critters that we've talked about here are all dinosaurs. They're part of the dinosauria, that one big clade. And within that clade, we are talking about the theropod. So everything here that we've talked about is a theropod. And now we're going to talk about the titanerae, the stiff-tailed theropods. And so even though we are going to break apart these branches into finer and finer branches so we can look more and more at details um, as we make our way to the birds, uh, just remember that um, everything we talk about is a titanerae. So an avatheropod is also a titanerae. It belongs in this clade of titanerae, but it belongs in a subclade, a clade within it of avitheropods. Um, and so birds are titanerae as well. So you can say that titanerae lived from uh, Jurassic times until the present. Okay, so the Spinosaurids, uh, really cool uh, dinosaurs uh, that would like to have been uh, crocodiles. Um, so they, we find them in the Cretaceous period in uh, many different continents, South America, Africa, Europe, Asia. They really look like they were piscivorous or fish eaters. Diagnostic characteristics really stand out. Very long, low skulls with lots of teeth, and expanded rostral ends, and caudally retracted nares. So the uh, nasals, uh, nasal openings are, um, are retracted back toward the tail, or back toward the back end of the skull. And um, let's take a look at what that means. And the teeth, uh, we've just uh, talked about the theropods having these uh, teeth with serrations, knife, sort of steak knife type type teeth. And here we are talking about where that particular uh, evolutionary novelty has disappeared. And we've got instead conical teeth, cone-shaped teeth, not flattened, and without those serrations. So we see how um, novelties or evolutionary um, diagnostic characteristics can be lost or changed in uh, future generations along a particular tree. Here is a Sucomanus, and uh, this uh, really uh, explains here. You can see that the teeth are well in front of the, here's the orbit back here. Teeth are well in front. It's also got this kink in the front of the jaw, this very distinctive uh, kink to it, which um, is really, um, has has a special use to it. Let's see. Here's um, a couple more um, images of a Sucomimus, one of the Spinosaurids. And here's a Gariel, uh, living crocodile uh, creature with the same sort of arrangement of its teeth and its long, narrow snout. And this is a this is a fish eater, and actually this long, narrow snout with these uh, expansive teeth and this little kink here at the end of the snout really helps to catch fish. So it, uh, it you know if you're trying to s snap at something that's underwater, you've got some of that water resistance. But if you get a narrow snout, it reduces that water resistance, so you can still snap pretty quickly. Um, so it's ideal for catching creatures that are swimming around. Um, and we see the same um, design in the Spinosaurids. So that's why one reason why they're, um, they're prob they probably were fish eaters. Here's that Sucomimus. Here's a, a more complete skeleton of it. Um, interestingly, let me see if I can uh, show you um, some examples here. Uh, let's see. Now this is... Okay, so this is a Baryonyx, which is one of the Spinosaurids. Uh, it's got that nice long snout here. Should be more of a kink here at the end. Sort of you could see it in the lower jaw, but in the upper jaw should be a kink. Stiff tail here in the back. Um, you know, pretty good sized creature. 
Um, this is to scale here. So here's um, here's a uh, paleontologist for scale. Um, had a nice um, nice big thumb here, really good sized thumb on on its on its hand. It's got those three digits. Um, so this is an example of a spinosaurid, but other spinosaurs, like the Spinosaurus itself, had these sailbacks. This still looks a little like that reptile uh, from before dinosaur times, the Dimetrodon, the uh, mammal-like reptile that had this sail, this sort of sail on its back. And this is the same thing with the Spinosaurus. Now, this is supposed to be a pretty accurate model. This is sort of old, though, and um, it's got the wrong skull on it. This should be a much, much uh, more crocodile-shaped skull here. So this is really um, not the right, um, not doesn't give you the right impression here. Uh, what could the sail have been used for? Well, we, we can guess that uh, maybe species recognition, maybe it was thermal regulation, ex um, heat exchange. These guys seem to live on the edge of, um, for example, on the edge of Sahara Desert. Um, so it was hot. Maybe this way of getting rid of uh, excess heat. Um, maybe it was for display purposes. Maybe it was to make the creature look even larger than this. Um, but it was a pretty darn good sized creature. Let me uh, see if I've got that. So there's a, there's a Spinosaurus with really the kind of uh, skull that you would expect. Part of the issue here, so let me, let me just say that, okay, here's the Suchomimus that we were looking at. Uh, uh, in those earlier figures. Here's a Tyrannosaurus. Here's a Gig Giganotosaurus. These are huge carnivores, but look at the size of Spinosaurus. It may have been the biggest carnivorous dinosaur of all. And um, if you saw the third Jurassic Park movie, um, there was a, a, a sort of incredible battle there at the beginning between a T-Rex and a Spinosaurus. Uh, guess who won? Um, uh, sort of unrealistic there that these two creatures would be duking, duking it out, but pretty exciting to see in a, in a movie, especially when um, when you've got uh, these two uh, cool guys going going after one another. You know, what can I say? It's it's uh, it's fun to watch. Um, part of the problem here, though, is that there, there's been fragmented remains of the Spinosaurus itself found. So its size is sort of reconstructed from the size of um, some of the vertebrae that have been found. Uh, it's got, you know, these high neural arches. We know that for sure, but we don't know about its limbs. The limbs haven't really been found. They are sort of put those on there because they were, we know it was related to a Suchomimus. Um, so there's a lot we don't know, but it could have been quite large. This is, this is a Suchomimus, uh, part of a, a fragment of its uh, upper jaw here. So you can see the sides we're talking about. This is the smaller guy. Here's, um, here's how that would fit into a, an actual uh, skull. And here, I'll just reduce it a little bit. Um, so you can see that this guy um, would have treated us as, as sort of uh, snacks. Um, if um, if we were back there in the Mesozoic. This is uh, another fa uh, feature, it's conical uh, teeth here, uh, not really for slicing and dicing, but for grabbing a hold and really uh, impaling something like a fish. And then we have this other group that's that we're not quite sure what to do uh, with the wasteback basket taxon, which is really interesting, the megalosaurs. Um, and we, um, they go way back in the sense that um, William Buckland in 1815 discovered uh, the jaw, the dentary, and the teeth of a carnivorous dinosaur he called the megalosaurus, or giant reptile. Published it in 1824, so right at the same time, more or less, that um, that Gideon Mantell, Dr. Mantell, published his um, his um, article on the iguanodon. So this is um, one of those uh, really first three dinosaur remains that were the first ones published in Western um, scientific literature. 
and the, the three that Richard Owen used um, to name a group called the Dinosauria because he saw them all, he recognized them all as a group of giant reptiles. So the Megalosaur, the Megalosaurus, the Iguanodon, and the Hyalosaurus, which was one of those uh, tank-like uh, thyreophorans. And just some uh, finish up here with some pictures of some megalosaurs um, at the, the Afrovenatar, the Torposaurus. Um, so this is a group that um, contains a number of interesting dinosaurs. Uh, I don't think we know a whole lot about it. Um, and so we're going to move on to the avitheropods uh, in the next slideshow. So uh, thanks for listening.